of uh, Avenade, we will discuss how to make software applications more carbon aware. So thank you, Shimon. Feel free to, to talk. Thanks. Thank you. All right, thanks for the introduction and thanks to all the folks that are still here around. I know it's the last day of a very eventful week, so I appreciate you being here. Um, I hope you enjoyed the conference so far and are ready for the, well, second to last, I think, talk of the, of the conference. Uh, for me, it definitely was very fun. Um, so I'll be presenting on uh, well, the green, concepts of green software. Um, some folks here might already be aware of them. Um, of those who aren't, uh, I'll be going through the basics as well. Um, and this normally, because the tooling I'll be explaining later on, the Carbon Aware SDK, um, normally sits higher up in the stack. This is not directly on embedded. This is going for uh, uh, workloads uh, in the cloud. But the green software obviously targets everything from hardware, from the silicon, all the way to big applications. So I'm really hoping to uh, get some input from you as well. And um, if you can, just while I'm explaining this, uh, these concepts, just give it a thought. And I'll give you some time throughout the, throughout the talk to uh, answer any questions or uh, jump in with your thoughts and ideas. And yeah. Um, so I'll start off maybe with who I am. Um, some of you may know me. Some of you may, uh, may not. Um, my name is Shimon. Um, I'm an open technology engineer at Avanad. And um, I'm also co-chairing the Carbon Aware SDK project, which I will be mentioning uh, later on in the talk. Um, it's a project that is uh, developed and uh, maintained by the Green Software Foundation. Um, so make sure to check it out after the talk. Um, recently, uh, for those of you who've seen my Tuesday talk with uh, Jakub, I've talked about, uh, I've been getting more into the embedded space more. It's been a thing I really enjoyed um, doing in my spare time and at, uh, well, earlier stages in my academic history. So it's good to be going back to it from the open source uh, side of it. Um, I'm currently a final year student um, at the master's program at, from computer science at University College London, but uh, I'm not putting their logo um, because I didn't ask for permission in time, but imagine it's there. <laughs> And uh, yeah, um, as mentioned on the slide, I dabble in the areas of uh, game development, embedded systems, IoT, uh, cloud engineering, and I'm pretty crazy about windsurfing, so if there are any surfing folks in here, uh, I can chat to you about that afterwards. Um, so uh, the talk, I already kind of gave it a brief introduction, but we'll do start off with an uh, intro to the Green Software Foundation, what it is, um, what are the core principles of green software, um, which we should be thinking about uh, with a slightly deeper dive in the carbon awareness and also in the uh, hardware efficiency part of it. Um, and finally, if we have the time for it, we'll do an uh, intro and a demo of the Carbon Aware SDK, so the project I've been co-chairing and a lot of folks developing. Um, so if I can just do a hands check, so raise your hand, who has heard about the Green Software Foundation in general? So we have three folks on the audience, okay. So we need to increase <laughs> our external visibility. But that's good that we have some knowledge. And I'll introduce that in a second. But first of all, just a quick stack, a stat, because people love stats. And um, software-related CO2 emissions in general uh, are actually, they account for roughly 4% of the uh, current world emissions, right? So this is more than the uh, air, rail, and shipping uh, in, uh, industry combined, right? So, you know, it's only 4%, so it doesn't sound like a lot, but like, you know, it's bigger than this. So we make an impact, and there's surely a lot of work for us to be done in that area. So uh, what is the Green Software Foundation? It's a foundation, foundation under the umbrella of uh, Linux Foundation, and it's a non-profit, uh, and it aims to build a trusted ecosystem of uh, people, standards, and tooling, uh, and best practices for green software, so for building uh, more energy efficient software and, uh, well, hopefully uh, for building more energy efficient uh, hardware that software will be running on. Um, if you want to learn more, please visit greensoftware.foundation and you can learn about the manifesto, uh, the mission and the vision of, uh, of the entire foundation. Um, so what we do at the GSF, as we abbreviate to, to 
is uh, we have discussions that are cover basically the full stack uh, uh, of, of software going from cloud applications uh, all the way to hardware. Um, but we are missing the expertise of embedded folks and there. Uh, a lot of the people involved in it are um, not experts in the field. They're not embedded systems uh, designers and engineers. Um, so although we try to um, encapsulate that as well, because this is a very important part of uh, where the emissions come from, when the energy consumption comes from, we need uh, your input in it. And if you are members of Linux Foundation, and a lot of people here I think are, um, you've, we very much welcome you to, to join this and uh, share your expertise uh, with us on the topic. Um, we are already collaborating with uh, CNCF, so the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, um, on um, implementing some of the tooling and to, of, on, on uh, extending the standardization around uh, green software. But again, we would love more input from people working closer to the hardware. Here's just an example issue that um, um, Chris linked to me of uh, some of the collaboration that's been happening uh, in this space between GSF and CNCF. Um, so either feel free to jump on those threads or just uh, join the GSF uh, GitHub and uh, yeah, uh, drop and see, what, see what's happening there. Um, and why should uh, we care about it? Why should uh, embedded engineers also care about it? Is well, basically, um, some of you might be aware of the greenhouse gas protocol, which defines the scopes of emissions um, of software. And there are three, uh, it, and it's split into three, three scopes. There are the um, direct emissions, so things like uh, company software, companies' facilities and management. So if you actually have some, uh, for example, forklifts uh, running around in, uh, in your company, right? Or um, the scope two, which are indirect emissions from electricity purchased, uh, steam, heating, and cooling. Um, so this is stuff you, uh, import from other providers, uh, well, mainly electricity, to uh, sustain your business, sustain your um, w w whatever you might be doing, even at your house, right? And then finally, there are the scope free indirect emissions from downstream and upstream activities. These are generally the hardest for everyone to calculate because this comes from things we do not, well, directly buy but are somewhere upstream or downstream in, uh, in our actions. So we, obviously, if we have produce open source software, it's very hard to know who is using the open source software, right, and uh, where it's actually running. So it's hard to find the footprint of it. And green software actually touches on, uh, oh, it c goes through every single uh, scope in here, right? So from the direct emissions, from some of the chips uh, the software might be running on, all the way to, uh, downstream stuff. Um, so green software principles is a set of core ideas. Um, by the way, maybe before I go further, are there any questions about this uh, this part of the, of the presentation? If uh, if not, I'll just jump on. If you have anything, just feel free to shoot your hands up. We don't have a lot of people, so we have plenty of time to answer questions. Well. Um, green software principles are some of the core ideas. Uh, behind building, uh, building greener and more sustainable software. And um, the GSF tried to encapsulate them in, in a few. And um, the next few slides will cover them in some detail. Um, I'll also link out to a training portal where you can uh, learn more about it and even get a uh, LF cert uh, if you want to learn. Well, in, if you want to increase your knowledge in the space. So um, there are three main ways how we, can, um, how we can improve and reduce the carbon footprint of our software. Um, the first one uh, and more, most obvious one is uh, energy efficiency. So consuming the least amount of uh, electricity as possible. This might be by improving the um, efficiency of our software running um, on our um, PCs or chips uh, or through other means. And the, second, uh, uh, the second way of how we can do that, which is uh, a bit harder to, to target, uh, but still just as important, is through hardware efficiency. 
Um, so one of them is using least amount of embodied carbon. I'll introduce that uh, topic in the next slides. And, uh, well, for just building more efficient hardware. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll get, when I get to it, I'll give some more examples. And then carbon awareness. So the last one, which is the least obvious normally, people don't really think about it as much, is uh, um, in principle doing more when electricity is dirty, uh, when electricity is clean, and doing less when it's dirty. Well, we wouldn't want to do it the other way. It's uh, pretty pointless. Um, or unless you want the whole planet to burn down, I guess, then want. But we don't want that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so, starting off with uh, carbon and energy efficiency. So, those are the first two principles, and they are very closely interlinked. Um, that's why I put them in a single slide. Uh, so, the first one, so uh, carbon efficiency is simply the idea of emitting the least amount of carbon possible, and energy efficiency is using the least amount of energy possible. Uh, why it's important is because when we produce electricity, obviously we burn coal, we burn gas, some of it comes from nuclear, some of it comes from solar, but in the end all of these actions uh, emit uh, some gases into the atmosphere. Not always carbon, but different kinds of gases. So by limiting the energy usage, we limit the uh, carbon emissions and hence we'll save our planet a little bit. Um, and to not think about all of these uh, different gases, different emissions, different pollutants, uh, uh, and to kind of bring it down to, so to make it easier for us also software engineers to think about them, to kind of group it together, uh, we normally uh, look at greenhouse gases in the carbon dioxide equivalent, right? So we bring all of the different gases, methane and so on, and we recalculate how much methane in the atmosphere, for example, is equal to uh, some amount of uh, carbon dioxide. And this gives us a leverage point to uh, build more standardized tooling, sorry, and to look, at less, um, to look at less of those gases so we don't have to um, spread ourselves so thin and narrow the gap a little bit. Um, an example of how you can recalculate is that, well, Methane, as I already mentioned, is a gas that's actually 40 times more warming than CO2. So obviously we cannot just do a one-to-one -one mapping. We say that one ton of methane would be uh, 40 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. Um, energy efficiency. So uh, the second thing I mentioned here, I should have actually jumped to these slides when I was talking about it, so you have some visualization. But again, just to resurfacing this, energy comes from different sources, oil, coal, gas. This, these emit CO2 equivalent, and this gets powered uh, when we run software. So that's why when we do more software, we use up more of those guys on the right, emit more CO2 equivalent. Um, also, another thing here worth mentioning is minimizing energy usage by maximizing utilization. Um, I think this is a rather a strong idea in the embedded space, is to use as much of the silicon as we can um, by, and by compressing our uh, software as much as possible and doing as many things on the limited silicon as we can. Um, basically, instead of, in, in cloud terms, it's instead of doing five servers at 20% utilization, we try to do one server at 100% or maybe, you know, to break it down to, so it's not fully throttled, but, you know, try to downsc downscale the amount of hardware that's running, but upscale the usage of it, the, the yeah, the percentage of what you use. Um, so here comes, I guess, the most imp interesting part uh, for you guys, the most, one, the most impactful from the embedded space is the hardware efficiency. Um, and it starts with uh, embodied carbon. Embodied carbon is the idea that every piece of silicon we produce requires some carbon to be emitted, carbon equivalent, I'll be just saying carbon because carbon equivalent is a bit too long, uh, to be emitted in the atmosphere. Um, so it's important to think about it in the long term and to try and use the software, the, the hardware as much as we can without, with the carbon, uh, with the embodied carbon making as small of an impact on the environment. And one thing 
how we can, one way how we can look at this is called uh, amortization. It's uh, basically the idea of, uh, well, amortize, 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 sorry, amortizing <laughs> embodied carbon is the idea of uh, spreading the uh, carbon, the embodied carbon over the expected lifespan of a device. So if we look at the graph here, and we have uh, our, um, our embodied carbon stacked up as 400 kilograms. Um, and if we look at, for example, four years of usage, so if you, look, if you use the device for four years, this uh, equates to roughly 1,000 1, kilograms of CO2 emissions per year. And one very basic way, and I'd say almost obvious way of uh, limiting this, of uh, decreasing this uh, um, emission is by increasing the lifespan of our hardware. So trying to uh, do promote more of uh, uh, renewable markets, of uh, reusing components that are already there. Some things that some companies are starting to do is, uh, uh, well, for example, oh, I'm going to bring up Apple, although they have some, well, yeah. Apple, for example, does recycling of uh, iPhones. You can bring in an iPhone, obviously you don't get a lot of money for it, but at least there is a chance they'll reuse some of the components. And some other companies do that too, it just doesn't count my uh, mind at the moment. And that way, just by increasing the lifespan, for example, of a device by a year, we are already reducing um, carbon emissions per year by 200 kilograms. So quite substantial. Um, these are obviously examples on uh, big server stacks. Like these the values would never be the same for a single, single microchip in our phone or, uh, or a microcontroller. But we need to think, when we think embedded, we need to think about IoT in this space um, and wearables so, and phones. So this directly translates here as well to, um, to scale. So uh, rather than each device having a big impact by itself, it's the number of devices that each have a small impact, right? But if we reuse MCUs or in, in, uh, increase the lifespan of a lot of IoT devices MCUs, this brings down the overall embodied carbon for the whole system quite substantially. So it's not just a single device, it's a lot of devices. Um, any uh, questions or thoughts on that space, on the hardware efficiency? Or are we all good to continue? Yep. Uh, okay, so um, you are talking about extending the lifespan of, uh, of the hardware, and yep. that's, uh, that sounds noble, but uh, I thought about one case because, for example, if I buy a laptop right now and use it for, let's say, five years, and then change it to another one, then of course the, the, the old laptop will go to waste and there, there are a lot of problems with that. But if I extend it, if I force myself to use it for 10 years, then of course I don't have the problem of uh, wasting the hardware for uh, just a small amount of time. But it will be very inefficient in five years, and I'll be, I'll be wasting a lot of power, a lot of uh, time, and uh, a lot of battery life and stuff. I, I might even waste money on replacement batteries and things like that, uh, which will contribute to the overall effect. And uh, have you done maybe some calculations? Maybe, uh, maybe do you have some, some ideas about what, what are the best strategies to, to, to offset those uh, conflicting goals? Right, yeah, it's, it's a very great question. It's the, I think, uh, most, com like, most best thing to jump to when you're thinking about this is, yeah, what is, where is the actual trade-off point? At which time does the embodied carbon, like increasing the life expectancy, no longer matter for me to grab a new device that is more efficient, uses less energy? And um, because, well, this is a very fresh space. GSF was founded two years ago. I'm not aware of a project uh, that is up and running and doing these calculations. There is a project called CarbonQL, which is looking at um, calculating the efficiency full stack of a device, but it's not doing the exact calculation you mentioned, right? So this is something that there is still an open space uh, in, uh, to, to look at. Um, but going back to, to your question of uh, when it's worth it, well, 
yeah, it, bring, it boils down to doing the calculation. If, uh, if you know that your device is, uh, if, if new device efficiency, you can calculate um, how much, for example, well, something I'll introduce in a second, software, what's its software carbon intensity rating for running some application. Let's, um, a laptop is a hard thing because it's an OS and it runs all kinds of applications, but if it's an MCU, for example, that's running a single ap application, this is easier to calculate. And if we change to a new MCU, we, would, we could possibly calculate its exact software carbon intensity, so, so how much carbon it's uh, producing uh, on that hardware. And then you could also compare it directly to your current uh, MCU. And if um, then you compare, um, well, the embodied carbon difference versus that, this will give you the, exactly what you want to know. Like, when is the cutoff point where do I switch from one to the other? Uh, it's just that this calculation is difficult. We are standardizing this. If I jump to the next slide, we have, we are, we have defined and released a a standard called software carbon intensity, which talks about three things. Embodied carbon, so what we just mentioned, software efficiency, uh, and carbon intensity. And this gives you an idea of, um, of a, some kind of score which allows you for measurement uh, in time between devices for specific applications. Right? This will not give you, um, just one second, this will not give you a comparison that can be uh, compared across all devices, but across, uh, across all applications, but for those applications, it can. Um, so yeah, so yeah, and just finishing off uh, again, yes, we are working on it. So your input would be greatly appreciated in this space. Um, yeah, so Cuba. just a couple of thoughts. Um, I don't want to take too long. So first of all, why there isn't a, I mean, that's a loose idea, like someone should come up with a solution like the, the calculator that, that I got this and this <laughs> equipment, or for example, I'm a end game gamer uh, and I need to, uh, I don't want to update my RTX to the newest one or I have this and that fleet of MCUs or, and should I keep on running them, or, or would it be better in terms of uh, power consumption uh, and total cost to 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 replace them with n newer ones, or more, let's say, uh, more green, right? So, so that's like I know it's a very difficult problem to solve, but having such a platform would be definitely beneficial to both. Uh, big players in the field uh, and people who produce uh, tons of and and just implement tons of them of the devices in the field that, that we're speaking embedded here yep and like regular end user like me who's considering just changing my laptop because it's uh, well yeah what what you explained just a moment ago um, yep. Yeah, exactly. And exactly, this, this is a perfect project that would go under the umbrella of Green Software Foundation. This is one of the things we, do, we want to target. It's just getting there is first finding the standardization of how you calculate it. This is something we have already, well, defined, right? Uh, the software carbon intensity, if you Google that, uh, you'll be able to find the spec of what you should be looking at. The issue is where, you get, where do you get the data? and how can you then compare it against other things. So on a, on a gaming example, uh, you could, for example, define exactly, hey, I'm running on an RTX something, I'm running on an Intel uh, core on this specific uh, hardware, this is the game I am running, and then you can define, define the software carbon intensity rating for that game on that hardware. And then, yep. So say you swap out your um, your graphics card or you use your laptop for longer. How does that actually affect the static power draw of the device? Does it use more energy over time? If you swap it out. Uh, well, the heavy depends on the device. For or using the laptop for longer as well. Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, very heavily depends on your device, right? Obviously, uh, 
if you have a battery, it will, it's like, it, it will decrease in capacity and there's more decrease in efficiency. So I do not exactly remember how it goes, uh, but I believe the efficiency will be worsening, right? Again, it's, it's a trade-off. You have to figure out what is the cutoff point where you, you should switch, where you should upgrade, which, when you should replace the part. Yeah, I mean, all of these things are really nice, but again, the issue, as you can see in the graph as well, is that um, the manufacturing is actually the most polluting part of it. So as much as efficiency is great, we're talking about the difference on, I know, 150 watts to 130 watts, while the actual manufacturing, which includes uh, purifying the silicon, uh, PCBs, bunch of components, all of this together with the shipping, is really just making all of this looks really, really, really insignificant. So, yeah. So, yeah, go for it. That's kind of what I wanted here. Uh, I wanted the open discussion. Yeah, I agree with you, but yeah, but just to respond to what you said before, if Apple making a device or HP are making it, you don't have any control over that, even if that's 80% of the emissions. Whereas if you treat all of it as out of our control, then we'll never make any improvements. As software engineers, we can still reduce this. So. Just a small question. Uh, did you heard of cold carbon? Uh, cold carbon. Oh, carbon code. I'm not sure. I've read about it like a few days ago. Um, it, it's not really in the embedded area, but it's more like um, running on the AVS uh, thing. So you, it's, it's, as far as I know, it's a Python script or something like that uh, that measures uh, the impact of your instance and knows about which server cluster um, uses which uh, combination of solar energy, coal, whatever, mm -hmm. and tells you if you migrate your whatever container from this to this, you save that amount of carbon. Um, it's just like, I don't know if someone heard of, about it. I read about it like a month or a I, few I, weeks ago, so. I haven't heard about it either, so uh, if you can drop me a um, link to that afterwards, it would be very cool. Uh, but yeah, it's definitely one of the important things. I have actually a few slides on carbon awareness, which talk about the shifting of stuff around in the world as well. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm mindful we still have some conversation going on and I'm more keen to have that as well. <laughs> uh, but if, if everyone's happy at the moment, like yeah, we can have some more Q&A afterwards. I know we only have like six minutes left or three. How many minutes? Uh, 13. Okay, so my clock is uh, very much off. Um, yeah, and so measurement, again, please do check out solar carbon intensity. It will give you an idea of uh, what are the ways to start looking at it? We just need the software also to calculate that. Um, and that is what, what we can do as software engineers, right? It would be very cool if we had it. Um, and the last, last principle mentioned here, the climate commitments, is uh, what are actually the methods for reducing the emissions um, like outside of the software, um, inside of software, but generally, how do we reduce uh, emissions? And I know it's a very small graph, so uh, you can find it on learn.greensoftware.foundation uh, with a, in the course material. But basically, the two main ways to do that, do that are either via offsets, so offsetting your carbon footprint, or by uh, abatement or elimination, so not emitting the carbon in the first place. And obviously, the second option is preferable, because you just never emit that at all. But uh, still, offsetting is very important, and it's a very important idea. It's just much, much complex. And in the energy space, it's a very heated discussion about uh, how you, do, you should do it properly, how you should do matching of your energy, do 24-7 matching, whether it should be hourly, daily, weekly. Uh, yeah. So just worth noting. And then the last one, um, last principle that I am more uh, more, no more of, I guess, and I worked closely with is carbon awareness. And uh, I really like just this, this, this sentence, is it just doing uh, more when electricity is cleaner and doing less when it's dirty. It's as simple as that, but there are a few ways how you can smartly improve it. 
Uh, it the relies on the idea of carbon intensity. Uh, carbon intensity uh, in electricity terms is the amount of CO2 equivalent released per each kilowatt hour spent uh, of energy. And um, this, for example, is a map from a carbon intensity data provider called uh, WattTime. And we can see um, here from the green leaf to the dark coal icon, this is how much uh, carbon intensity, what's the carbon intensity level in a different region. And uh, for example, graph here on the top of it shows us that this directly is related to what sources are, what energy sources are being used in, in the space at the time. So let's say uh, we have 120 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour, and that means there's a lot of wind, there's a lot of solar, and let's say later in the day, the uh, sun stops shining as intensely, wind stops blowing as fiercely, and we have to rank up more on burning fuel, burning gas, uh, burning coal, and this increases our CO2, right? So we will be emitting more carbon for the same amount of electricity we're using. Um, I hope that everyone gets that, right? Cool. Um, this is, um, a, I guess, not directly carbon awareness, but also how, how the mechanism works um, when, we, uh, when we have an um, energy consumption on the grid and uh, we, uh, th there's the, the demand is, so this is going for a workflow how, of how um, energy consumption might happen on the market. So let's say we had uh, demand going down and there is still, still some wind, still some solar in the system. So we decide to burn less of the um, fuels, uh, uh, non-renewable uh, fuels. And later on, let's say, uh, the wind starts blowing, the sun starts shining, and then there is this uh, curtailed energy that appears above our graph. What this means is energy that we're not actually using, uh, but we could be using because it's available, right? So it gets thrown away, no one's using it, we cannot uh, use that energy. So with carbon awareness, the idea is you identify those times when there is more energy, there is more energy in the system, and you increase the demand. So you shift your workloads, so you shift your operations to operate at the times when this curtailed energy is being wasted, and instead we can shrink down the usage of uh, carbon of other carbon producing uh, uh, sources. Just be mindful that this can never go to zero as long as we have uh, uh, non renewable well not not non renewable but um, carbon producing uh, power plants in the world because they always need to be running at some uh, at some level. Uh, yeah, we, just, we, not, we cannot shut them down. It takes too much an energy and time to restart them. Yeah, no worries. When coal power plants are run they need to be run at 70% capacity because uh, otherwise they aren't cost effective and cost efficient. So when they go down below, that's why then they are closing down coal power plants and they cannot be run as peaker plants. Uh, when you run them as peaker plants, they have to be started well in advance. When you use virtual power plants from batteries and such, you can go in with a moment's notice, but when you are running coal and oil, they have to be run in advance and run at at least a capacity of 70%. Okay. So that is a little bit uh, of a... Cool, thanks for, for, thanks for adding that. Yeah, I, um, yeah that's actually a, a, a number I didn't know, so it's cool to learn new stuff from the audience. Uh, and yeah, thanks. A really important point, yeah, that's one of the points we cannot shut them off or get them too low. Um, jumping on to the first idea in carbon awareness of how you can apply it is uh, time shifting. Um, so if you look at this, this graph, the, green, the green, blue line, the blue line is the carbon intensity that varies throughout the day. We have it between 400 and down to, well, zero is a bit uh, 
optimistic, but let's say that's actually like 200 or something like that. That's more realistic. Uh, that's the carbon intensity on the grid. And then, uh, sorry, and then the green bar is uh, our job. It's a, it's a one hour long job. Okay, five minutes, uh, mindful of that. It's a one hour long job that is originally running at 1 a.m. to 2 a.m. And let's say we are looking at um, the actual carbon intensity with through tools like the Carbon Hour SDK, and we realize that actually we can move the, the job one hour forward in time, so plan ahead, and this will then run at a time that has uh, lower carbon intensity predicted, and we can possibly save some carbon being emitted by doing it later. Uh, so this is time shifting. Location shifting, it's a bit more radical, and it's not always as easy to apply. It really depends on your specific use case, but this uh, means totally moving your uh, workload to a different location. This is in cloud, in, in, in the cloud, right, is it's more easy to apply than embedded systems. We cannot just ship our systems to run in a different country. Uh, it probably would kill the, the entire idea. But actually, maybe this is, a, this is actually an, a cool analogy, because uh, a, an important thing when moving your workloads is also the shipping cost of it, right? You have to ship data to a different location and communicate with it. So you have a trade-off of you're moving it to a location that's much greener, let's say Spain, there is a lot of sun, but at the same time, if this is a service running in the US, you're doing all of that shipping of your data, of your embedded systems, or data, yes, uh, to a different location, and that shipping also requires some, some energy spent. So it's another thing you have to keep in mind. Um, yeah, that's a cool analogy. I like it. Um, and the last thing is the combination of two a little bit, I guess, or brightly more advanced version of uh, time shifting. It's uh, demand shaping. So uh, the blue line is, again, carbon intensity. The green bar is uh, the um, intensity of your job, how much you're doing on your, uh, on your hardware. So how much, like, yeah, let's say how, much process, how many processes you're running. And it's the idea that if you have something, like a, let's say a system that is processing um, some data, and this can be shrunk down. So let's say you don't have to process all of the data at a specific point in time, uh, but you can accumulate and then do it later. Then you can wait for a time where the carbon density actually goes lower and uh, expand, uh, expand, let's say, the number of either turn on more devices that will be processing the data or just spawn more jobs uh, that will be processing it, so increasing uh, electricity usage by increasing the efficiency or using more computers to do it and utilize, really utilizing that green time. And I know I only have three minutes left, so this will be a very, very brief introduction to the Carbon Error SDK, so the tooling we actually already developed in the Green Software Foundation had a first release and are soon to get a 1.1 uh, release for 1.2, it's getting pretty, pretty big. Um, but in principle, uh, it's a tooling that answers some of these issues. Uh, please feel free to review the slides afterwards for more info on them. But the biggest issues are the open source issues. So there is a lot of disparate approaches in different, uh, in different companies trying to address it, trying to build Carbon Hour tooling. And this gives you an open source tool to, to solve that. Uh, there is the issue of integrity of approaches. So how do we actually know we're not greenwashing? How do we know you use uh, real data for it? And um, another interesting point is um, the need for a unified approach, right? We want everyone to be able to collaborate to know the, the standards for doing this. Um, where it sits is it will sit between your application and somewhere uh, and uh, the data sources. Right, so if it's a cloud application, it will be as a, a deployed uh, API um, or, or a CLI, and it consumes the intensity data and gives you a unified uh, interface for all of them, because there, believe me, there are many uh, data sources for carbon intensity data already, so having a single interface for all of them is pretty useful, and just saying, hey, give me the forecast for carbon intensity data in a unified unit. Um, I know I'm jumping through all of it a, bit, a, bit, a little bit. I normally have a demo of, this, of using this. Uh, and uh, the demo is a Jupyter notebook, which you can find on the, on, on the GitHub. 
but it basically just shows, I don't know, I'm clicking through it, but it basically just shows how uh, you can affect your carbon intensity by doing some time shifting on a 55-day example. So let's say we're moving from a certain time to a different time. Uh, the red line, the blue line are carbon intensity values in different locations. Visually, you can see there is a difference. So it normally shows you some examples of how you'd, how you'd do it. I also have an um, open source, not yet upstream, the demo um, of, uh, of the SDK in a Kubernetes environment, which for the cloud folks uh, here is, uh, yeah, um, you should be aware of what it is at least roughly. Um, and the wrap up, um, carbon aware software is central to decarbonization. It's one of the key points of decreasing it. So please look at it at least. We already have, um, well, quite a few folks being involved in it. Uh, last time I took the screenshot, we had 200 stars. Now we did 325 or 15. So it'd be cool to, to have you there. If not, there's a plenty of projects in the Green Software Foundation, which we'd be happy to have embedded engineers involved in. Um, and uh, we don't have a time for q and I wish you all a safe journey back from the conference. Uh, finally, I'll just leave the QR code for the training if someone wants to scan it and look at it. And sorry for going over time. All right, uh, thanks, it's very interesting. Uh, so we had a couple of questions. I think we can have uh, some, the next session is in 10 minutes. So thanks again, Shimon. Yep. Have you got any question? I know it's, uh, it's quite a complicated topic, so go ahead, yeah. Yeah, one question, you, you showed a graph uh, of the uh, carbon levels, yeah, this graph. Uh, is it just like real-time data or uh, can you get some kind of a forecast so, so you can plan ahead? That's a great question. That's a great question I normally answer <laughs> during the presentation. Uh, you can get both historical data and uh, forecasted data. So what time, as a one provider, it gives you a roughly a day advanced data. Uh, electricity maps gives you much more. It's just they have prediction models looking at it. There is a very cool study um, posted by UBS and Microsoft of them doing it to uh, build their software more carbon awarely. So if you just Google UBS Microsoft Carbon Awareness, you can probably find it, where they actually show the differences they, they noted between forecasted and uh, actual data when they got to the future point. But thanks. Yeah. Another question? All right, so I think that we have a last presentation in eight minutes.